Hi everybody, hope you're well. Today I will read a text by Jack Self titled Default Grey, published on Real Review issue number 14. The average human spends 1,004 minutes awake and 436 minutes asleep each day. You are essentially dead for one-third of your life, trapped in a state of suspended consciousness and physical paralysis, transfixed by hallucinations emanating from altered brain activity. The average human is connected to the Internet for 397 minutes each day. You are essentially dead for another third of your life trapped in a state of suspended consciousness and physical paralysis, transfixed by hallucinations emanating from self-illuminating screens and magnetic sonic membranes. This average figure of 397 minutes sounds quite high. It would be much higher if it wasn't distorted by Africa, which makes up 70% of the world's population, but only 11% of Internet users. Africans have the smallest regional penetration and shortest daily access times of any continent. In the coming years, when Africa becomes as well-connected as the Americas, Asia or Europe, the average human will spend closer to 534 minutes, almost 9 hours, online every day. Is this significant? What are the individual and collective consequences of being connected to the Internet for such a large part of our lives? Existing online is for most an inescapably impoverished quality of being. Our bodies are located at a moment in a place and are equipped with five senses. The Internet is not anywhere or anytime, but is an invisible digital medium through which we access only audio and visual information. To spend so much of our lives in this state is to remove ourselves from the presence of the world. I am not making a value statement here, though. I don't mind spending a third of my life asleep, for example. I don't consider it a waste or worry that too many dreams will corrupt my waking self and pervert my relationship with reality. The duration of our Internet usage is only relevant if what is happening to our minds and bodies during that time online has deleterious consequences for the period when we are not online. What do people do with all this time on the Internet? The five most visited websites are Google, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. The 20 most popular sites account for 93% of all traffic and include 7 social media platforms, 4 search engines, 3 adult content sites, 3 email clients with associated productivity office suits, 1 news media outlet, 1 crowdsourced encyclopedia, 1 global e-commerce site, one video-on-demand service, and one AI chatbot. If visitor statistics are to be believed, measuring activity precisely is extremely difficult when there are over 1 billion active users at any moment. A typical day for our average human involves half an hour of YouTube, DIY tutorials, 20 minutes of Googling, health questions, map directions, some sport, and a little weather. 20 minutes of stalking ex-friends on Facebook. 20 minutes trolling on Twitter. A quarter of an hour failing to get a dopamine hit on the gram. Another quarter of an hour on Reddit's stocks and memes. A cursory Amazon shop. A couple of hours of email, powerpoints, and spreadsheets. A quick zoom and a rerun on that show we used to watch in university. It is not just idle hands that are the devil's workshop. Our day concludes with a solid 22 minutes of high-definition pornography. The grandchildren will ask what everyone was doing as the planet's ecosystems collapsed. 
we were fiddling while earth burned. Although a curiosity, the content that we access online is a lot less important than how we access it. One thing to say is that our relationship with content is asymmetrical. We download a lot more than we upload, by a factor of at least 100. The Internet user is a passive recipient. Even if we have the feeling that we are an active participant shaping our unique journey through a chaotic mess of information, in fact, we are being guided. We assume we are unearthing content related to prompts and demands that could only have originated with us. In fact, we are bombarded by the experiences and thoughts of other people, or non-humans, which we internalize. What we perceive through the Internet is a vicarious construct, a second-hand reality that we mistake for the real world. This experience is designed to be stimulating, but is distorting our relationship with the fundamental principles of what can be known. In highfalutin terms, the Internet is an epistemological catastrophe, even as it appears like an infinite font of meaningful knowledge. The purpose of the Internet is to sell you something, or to sell you to something else. To achieve this goal, the Internet complex has cultivated an algorithmic health of reactive and responsive sirens fed by our own engagement and input, exaggerating our existing preferences, opinions, traits, abilities, motivations, appearances and ideas about the world. Neither of these observations will come as news. We have become comfortable in our eco chambers and silos. Nonetheless, the essentially non random nature of the Internet is easy to forget. The Internet is not like reality, because reality is random, or at least so complex that we cannot understand it. We know almost nothing about how it works whether it has universal laws or if those laws remain constant over time. We do not know why our descriptions of very small scales, the quantum, and very large scales, the general relativity, are internally self-consistent, but still incompatible with each other. The Internet's recommendation engine relentlessly nudges us towards what it knows we already want to see and hear. If our worldview is coextensive with the Internet, the universal familiarity, absence of chance, of surprise, of excitement, serves only to reinforce a dangerous misconception that there are no coincidences or unknowns in reality either. This is an entirely reasonable conclusion to draw from spending time on the Internet, even though it is a wholly irrational position about the world, and a fundamental confusion about cause and effect. At the slightest gesture, you can conjure a meaningful answer to any conceivable question. The immensity of information on the Internet can lead to a sense that anything you wish to know is already known, and can be retrieved at will. There is almost the sensation that, by posing the question, we ourselves as users have generated the unique response, that we are the agents of knowledge creation. Certainly, this is what the next generation of artificial intelligence is rapidly pursuing. An infinitely customized internet, where every piece of content is composed live for our personal benefit. In other words, the internet is a domain governed by magical thinking, which is the belief that your ideas, thoughts or use of symbols can influence events in material reality. Offline, magical thinking can take the form of superstition, the law of attraction, astrology or horoscopes, psychic phenomena and a raft of other irrational beliefs. 
At its base, magical thinking attributes meaning and significance to a set of information that have no measurable systemic or discernible connection. It reframes coincidences and synchronicities as messages from the universe or some other superhuman force. Advocates of magical thinking might be leaning into such irrational structures for a number of reasons, psychological comfort or because of some personal experience they cannot explain, or because a specific ritual is part of their cultural tradition. If you compare surveys charting the growing public belief in fate and destiny onto the rising number of minutes spent each day on the Internet, there is a compelling similarity. This might be correlation, not causation. But I suspect that by increasing our exposure to a mirrored reality, defined by predictive algorithms, we have become deranged. Any civilization that chooses relative subjectivity over verifiable materiality has already signed its own death warrant, because it leaves itself vulnerable to otherwise foreseeable risks. It is the anti-vaxxer dying from Covid, but it is more than just post-truth. Such a position also crushes imagination and the possibility of meaningful social change. If you are constantly told that your political party or special identity group is at war with another political party or special identity group, then you come to believe that these parties and identities objectively exist and are immutable. You do not see them as historically contingent constructs. This ideological entrenchment, or lacuna on the real, produces societies that are ossified and ill-equipped for adaptation, compromise, negotiation or discussion. An internet-connected society is one that lacks a civic sphere. The platforms and companies that have shaped today's internet were so obsessed by the elimination of chance because their business model is advertising. As I said above, the purpose of the Internet is to sell you something, or sell you to something. The Internet leaves no room for accidental or non-commercial thought. This has had the effect of destroying the user's relationship with reality and the possibility of any meaningful social identity, both individual and collective. Before the digital era, identity was constructed and expressed in multifaceted and nuanced ways. A framework of roles and expectations emerged from the interaction between social institutions, the family, education, religious organizations, the media. These norms shaped how an individual perceived themselves and was perceived by others. Some aspects of identity were imposed on individuals as a consequence of structural power inequalities. Other aspects were voluntary associations formed by cultural influences or interpersonal interactions and feedback. From birth, we were each progressively socialized or conditioned to understand and internalize what was deemed appropriate and what constituted common sense. A person possessed many identities, some of which were contradictory, some of which evolved over time, some of which were known only to the individual, and all of which were contingent on the fluidity of immediate context. Their symbols and rituals engaged every aspect of the human experience, how you looked, smelled, sounded, how you moved through space and how you embodied time. On the Internet, identity is not nuanced. It is always and already explicit. We are all exposed. Online, no part may be concealed from another. To engage with the Internet, you must identify yourself. Your identity is the grabby data thumbprint on the smooth glass of the platform. 
Your identity is a homunculus, or maybe a golem, born from the aggregate mass of Amazon purchases and Pornhub histories, and Netflix viewings and Tinder swipes. The internet has no shadows, and it is constantly piecing together data points to judge you. From the perspective of the platform, all of your qualities are simultaneously visible and reducible to combinations of known variables – age, location, politics, subculture, race, gender, kinks, acquisitions and disposals, as well as a detailed analysis of every metric you have ever provided by engaging with another human or a machine. These are each distinct values, but they are immaterial. They exist like currencies with fluctuating exchange rates, and each one can be expressed as an equivalence of every other quality. They are not interchangeable, but they are endlessly exchangeable. It is as if intersectional feminism has been reimagined by Homo economicus. In 3D modeling softwares, by default, all material is grey. Textures or skins are applied to this nondescript digital clay, giving it any possible appearance. Water, diamond, fur, fire, wood, skin. Rendering technology may make the specific entity look extremely convincing, but these surface-level qualities merely obscure the fact that virtual objects are all instances of a universal substance. Default grey is an apt metaphor for our contemporary condition, in which all difference is superficial. This does not mean that difference is meaningless, nor that all subjectivities are homogeneous. That would be an absurd and insulting claim. Even in virtual reality, fire is not skin. What it does mean is that every apparent difference now circulates within a single dimension, the dimension of communication. Jean Baudrillard foreshadowed this condition as early as 1987. Obscenity begins when there is no more spectacle, no more stage, no more theatre, no more illusions, when everything becomes immediately transparent, visible, exposed in the raw and inexorable light of information and communication. We no longer partake of the drama of alienation, but are in the ecstasy of communication. The idea that we are all declinations of a common alienated subjectivity, a kind of faceless, nameless user, removed from our own minds and bodies, is seductive because it describes our physical relationship with the Internet complex. Material reality is draining, cultural reality is supposed to provide an escape. Work and leisure are complementary subjectivities under capitalist modernity. One is extractive and one is restorative. One is dehumanizing, one is humanizing. This was the pact struck between industry and civil society at the end of the 19th century, when democratic and labor struggles carved out freedoms from perpetual work, holidays, weekends, hobbies. The Internet has occupied all of the time that was once the domain of leisure. But the Internet is not a restorative space, it is an infinite gradient of work intensities. The best we can hope for is mind-numbing media that placates, even as it fails to capture our full attention. We are disembodied, but we are not relaxed. As the screen comes up to our face, it is as if our eyes close and we dissolve within the data flow. The images and sounds that surround us are not local, we have almost no peripheral awareness. If we look at a picture of our own home, or of our own parents, or ourselves, we do not see the entity in question, only its abstraction. 
all places, near and far, and all times, ancient and recent, and all things, people and objects, function in this simulation of pure science. Worse, the sign replaces the real. The simulacrum, the copy without original, becomes more real than the real, it becomes hyper-real. This type of experience seems to support the idea of a universal alienated subjectivity, but that would be wrong. Default grey is not one thing or even anything, it is immaterial. In computing, every variable has a value. This might be expressed as a functional equation, but it is always underpinned by a string of integers, the gates 1 and 0. So, while fire and skin may be different combinations of ones and zeros, they are mutually recognizable within a digital reality. I am not arguing for the importance of reclaiming our time from the Internet on the basis of some ludic technophobia. I am not trying to tell you to switch off your device and go feel the grass between your toes. The situation is far more entangled. We are possessed by the Internet. It is the foundational technology of our entire civilization. In fact, I am not really arguing for anything per se. I am describing what I see all around me. Extreme fatigue and addiction, magical thinking and denial. The Internet is as charming and obscene as hardcore porn. If we cannot reclaim our time, we should at least be more conscious of what we have lost. Unintentional and accidental chance occurrences. A direct perception of reality's complexity. The sensation of our bodies. The space of potential and imagination. Identity as a multitudinous gradient of engagements. In its place, we have substituted the predictable, infinite sameness and stasis of a total commodified reality. Ask for real review at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.